The degree of resistance that the Iraqis showed to our investigation of their biological weapons program exceeded all other deceptions and resistances. So I had to conclude that, for Saddam, biological weapons were his weapons of choice. Richard Butler, former UNSCOM chairman. Welcome back to Inside Iraq. We are talking to Hans Blix, the former executive chairman of Onmovik, the top UN weapon inspector in Iraq. Mr. Hans Blix, how do you look at this war? Is it a legal war? No, I think most international lawyers around the world have concluded that it was a, a war in violation of the United Nations Charter. The uh, Charter allows states to use armed force in self-defense against an armed attack. And clearly, neither the United States or the United Kingdom were subject to an armed attack. Uh, the Charter also allows the Security Council to authorize the use of armed, armed force, even if there is only a threat to the peace or breach of the peace. And so the Security Council could have authorized the, the, the armed for use of armed force. However, the U.S. and the U.K. argued that earlier resolution by the Security Council had been violated by the Iraq and that they, the Alliance, were entitled to take action in order to enforce the Council decisions. Most lawyers, and I agree with them, would say that no, it's not the individual members that can do that, but it's the Council that could do so. And the Council, in the Council, there was no majority for such an action. So there was really no legal basis for the war. If it is a legal, a legal war, would you go as far as saying it is a criminal war? Well, it's a violation of, of, the, of the UN Charter. And um, I don't know whether the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court uh, speaks about that, that you'll have to look into the definition of the criminal law. The, the reason, violation of the UN Charter, clearly. The reason why I'm asking <laughs> is this, because if this was a quick... Um, Cakewalk war, as, as it was uh, propagated and was marketed, this is going to be done and over in a few weeks. Um, the U.S. troops, they're going to go and remove Saddam and install democracy and come back. Perhaps nobody would have talked about it, but given the magnitude and the enormity of the sacrifices and the bloodshed and the destruction and uh, people lost their lives, surely somebody, somehow, somewhere, needs to pay a price for this. It was a tragic miscalculation, and it was not only the question of the weapons of mass destruction. That was the point they advanced in defense of going to war, because it was the point that was the most easy to sell to the public, and to the U.S. Congress, and to the British Parliament. But there were other arguments, such as the introduction of democracy. Well, that failed also. To introduce democracy by occupation and by force is not so easy. There was also the allegation that they would take out al-Qaeda, but al-Qaeda was not there. Al-Qaeda came later on. And there was this allegation that this would help Israel. I don't think one would agree that it's helped Israel very much. If it helped anybody, it was probably were the Iranians and the Shiites. You ticked several of the possibilities for the war. Would you go as far as another one, oil perhaps? I do think that the Americans believed there were weapons of mass destruction. They believed in the democracy argument and so forth. But I think that basically even more important was the, the concern about oil. Uh, in the war in 1991, they went against Saddam Hussein because they feared that he would take over the Gulf and perhaps Saudi Arabia, and he would sit on all the oil resources. Uh, in uh, 2003, they felt uncomfortable in being in Saudi Arabia, and they felt they needed land, land troops on land somewhere else. And what was a better place then than Iraq, which had the second biggest oil resources? and uh, which, if they only could get rid of Saddam, they hoped would be a friendly place. I think that's still a calculation, that they want to have troops on land, and that Iraq is a good place for it. Moreover, it allows them to have a thumb on in the eye on the Iranians. So oil, I think, uh, is, remains an important and a, a vitally a central reason for their war. Mr. Blix, many people say the United States really did not know whether Iraq possessed WMDs or not. But let me take you back to 1995, when Saddam's uh, son-in-law, Hussein Kamel, defected to Jordan. He was debriefed and debriefed extensively by the CIA. At, th at the end of those sessions, the CIA came out that Saddam really destroyed all his WMD's weapons back in 91, fearing that the U.S. might, you know, f catch him in the act. So the notion that 
the administration mm. did not know really does not tally with reality. More importantly, let me perhaps refresh your memory and the memory of our viewers. Uh, Scott Ritter, one of the top UN inspectors, uh, part of ONSCOM, he was on record, you know, as, as time wore on, he came to the conclusion Iraq did not possess WMDs, and he said so publicly. Yes, I remember that Scott Reader said that in 2003. Uh, however, it is very hard that, to prove that something does not exist. And that was really what we were asked to do. We carried out 700 inspections in about 500 sites. And what we could say was that with all the professionalism, we did not find anything. We didn't say that it was, was chemically free of, of any weapons of mass destruction. But the probability was that there was nothing left. Now, as to the <coughs> son Can I stop you here for Saddam just a second, Mr. Blix, for no, just a second? Sure. Because your critics sure. take this against you, and that is at the most crucial juncture uh, uh, before the war, when you and Mr. al Baradi had the chance to say, Mr. President, Mr. Dick Cheney, to the <coughs> best of our ability, we are telling you WMDs does not exist. And instead, you said something else. Well, we would not have had credibility to say there is nothing, because as I explained to you, and I explained to the Security Council, you cannot, it's very hard to prove that nothing exists. We did say that we had carried out extensive inspections all over, and uh, that we had not found anything. That's not exactly the same thing as saying there's nothing to exist. But most of the world, like yourself, took us to mean that we don't really think there is something. We needed a little more time, and if we had had more time, then we would have been able to go to all the sites suspected, and I think they would have been more conclusive at that point. At a certain point, just before the war, you and Mr. al Baradi met, uh, I don't know whether it was uh, just uh, eight eyes, you and Mr. Bush and Cheney and Mr. al Baradi. Can you, if you are, uh, can you tell us, can you tell us exactly, give us, uh, put us in the atmosphere, exactly what happened in that crucial meeting? <clears throat> well, I think the meeting was arranged by Colin Powell. He wanted inspections, and he had worked for it in the fall of 2002, at a time when many other on the American side were not very keen to have UN inspections because they thought that might make things more difficult for them. So he had probably arranged for it, and I think that he wanted to show to uh, the president and his entourage that uh, El Barde and I were no madmen but were, were capable people. And I think he also wanted to have an assurance through Bush that the U.S. supported our work. Now, Mr. Cheney, I think, <coughs> did not really uh, feel that he supported our work. When we met him just before seeing the president, he, he said to El Barde and myself that, that <coughs> we will not hesitate to discredit you in favor of disarmament. Well, I think the meaning of that was that if you guys don't come up with the right conclusions, we will do it. And that's what they tried to do. Well, that was not even a veiled threat. To me, that is a direct threat. Now, you are the last man on earth to say, I told you so and I warned you. But looking at Iraq and looking at the American dilemma, especially their loss of U.S. credibility, let alone the Treasury and the enormous life loss, how do you look at Iraq and were you ever tempted to go back to certain key people and told them, you guys, what did you do? Well, it's a horrible tragedy. I think that during this long period since 9, 2003, we have also learned that anarchy can be even worse than oppression. Now, Saddam is gone, and that is a good thing. And I have been much impressed by the power and by the resourcefulness of the Iraqi people. I met many Iraqis, they're very resourceful. And my hope is really that they will come back, that they will come together. I, I doubt that one, that the solution of dividing Iraq into three, that this is a viable way of going around. If I look back at something else with regret, it is when I know that, or we have been told by media, that both Mohammed Abardeh and I were bugged by the media, then it's a curse to me that, well, I wish to heaven that they had listened a little more carefully to what I had to say over the phones. Once bitten, twice shy, do you think the administration will ever repeat this colossal blunder by doing the same in Iran? I hope not. And I think that they are aware that going at Iran with weapons would be a colossal tragedy and colossal danger to the whole region. I'm just amazed that they are so slowly coming to a conclusion that I think has been clear a long time ago, namely that you must convince Iran that they have no need for nuclear weapons if they were intended to go for nuclear weapons. 
and they wouldn't have a need because they could guarantee, get guarantees about security. In uh, the 1980s, maybe they feared the Iraqis, and rightly so. But now they should have no fears if the United States is willing to commit themselves not to use force. And the second point that the U.S. has also not offered them yet is diplomatic relations. The Ira Iranians have not had diplomatic relations with the U.S. since the occupation of the embassy. And I think that they crave sort of recognition in the world. The U.S. is offering that to North Korea. I do not understand why it's the same thing is not offered to Iran. I think here are two pieces of leverage that has not yet been used. And I think before they are used, one cannot say that the diplomatic path has been exhausted. Mr. Hans Blix, thank you for being a guest of Inside Iraq. To access the show, to send us your comments, please go to aljazeera.net forward slash English. That's all the time we have for this week. Join me next week when we take another look inside Iraq. Until then, goodbye. Thank mm -hmm. you.